Up next, we have a wonderful opportunity to meet an artist whose social practice has taken him into thinking about accessibility and empathy and how they function in relationship to his work as an artist and also his engagement with various communities. Please help me welcome Carmen Papilla. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Carmen. I'm gonna be talking about the work that I've been doing about accessibility. Usually I make work that's like socially engaged and it's, it's addressing my own access in different contexts. So I'm gonna start by showing um, a piece that I made in 2007. And so this was about the time that like I started using a white cane and I used, I used to use a typical white cane that was just, you know, a typical length like this one over here. But in 2007, I made a 15-foot cane. And uh, I wanted to distance myself from the Disability Support Institution, the institution that the cane is, is uh, connected to. So I made this, and I would go on walks with it. And I would like, you know, tap it from side to side. And you could imagine the trouble I got into. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there. But, um, whoa. So I made a 15 foot cane and um, it was really at this time where I, I felt like the cane really was positioning me and it, uh, it, it really felt like I could be holding this thing and people would read my body a certain way and then if I wasn't holding this thing, people wouldn't put me in that, you know, read my body in that way and put me in that category. So I sort of wanted to play with that like distance and those social dynamics a bit and so I kind of just like would walk with, with this thing and people would just like it, it, stay out of my way. And um, it was a way for me to like claim public space um, and also kind of like inflict my presence upon other people. And it, I, it, it was a little bit antagonistic, but it was at a time where I felt like really disabled by the city. Um, and this is the cane that I use now um, I basically just took all the white and red tape off my cane and there's this like nice graphite material underneath Then I just replaced the handle with this wooden handle um, and so I Yeah, I, I kind of like wanted to with with this cane especially just kind of like disrupt the message that the cane is always transmitting which is this person needs help I also I think about the cane sort of as like a, a white flag um, it it often, you know, it, it's a magnet and a repellent at the same time. Um, it, it like brings people towards me that really with the best intentions want to offer support, but often don't know how. And they, uh, you know, sometimes these interactions really hap happen really fast and I wouldn't be able to advocate for myself. And, you know, I'd get someone to grab my arm and maybe like drag me across the street or direct me to a seat. and. It was, you know, very uncomfortable and I just wanted to like kind of disrupt that a bit. That was what I was waiting for. Uh, that, okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, and then I started, I guess like this, I, I've been using this cane for a while now and it's been working pretty well. Uh, I call it my detection cane because I really don't use it for identification. I use it just to like find obstacles. Um, People are gonna have to tell me if my images are, are coming up. So, um, is, is there an image up there? Uh, now? No. Not yet, darn. Yeah. Okay, so um, I've been um, in this process of kind of like replacing my cane with different things over the last few years. And so in 2013, I was working with the Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana, California and I replaced my white cane with a high school marching band. Um, <laughs> uh, and so over like this six month period, I was in conversation with this band 
And uh, they were kind of interviewing me on the kinds of like my, my walking routes and like the kinds of things that I might encounter on a walk and obstacles. And then they went off and like made these, um, uh, kind of developed these musical cues. To, and we developed this system. So it was really about like replacing one system of support with another and really just kind of thinking about like, you know, trust and, and modeling, modeling mutual support in, in this scenario that we kind of just, this arrangement that we kind of agreed upon. Um, on the day before the performance, we just had a short rehearsal in the high school parking lot, and we just kind of like played out these scenarios. And I was like, so pretend I'm walking from like the, the curbside to like a busy street, what would happen? And um, the ma marching band director kind of like worked between me and the band trying to anticipate where I might go. So it was really important for me to have like freedom to explore and the agency just to e explore this place that was unfamiliar to me, which was like downtown Santa Ana. And I found my way into like underground parking structures and restaurants and art galleries. And yeah, so that was that. Is that another image? Okay, cool, cool. Okay, it's working. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, this is along the same lines. I, I, uh, in 2015, I kind of gathered a bunch of sound making devices and like an air horn and a megaphone and I kind of just like dropped my cane and started using the megaphone to just like <laughs> identify myself uh, and kind of like to, to reclaim or perform the social function of the cane. So like just choosing the words to identify myself in the moment um, and also to like hail support. So I'd find myself like at a street corner. I'd just kind of be like, is anybody out there that can help me cross the street? And, um, and yeah, so it, it, I've also re-performed this process in a couple other cities and it's kind of like this, this method for me to like um, find my way through the city through like just a, a putting, putting that, that call for support um, out to my community or to, out to the public. Um, as a means of wayfinding. Cool. Um, this is a walking tour that I've been lead leading um, <laughs> since. <laughs> is it a long line of people? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so like since 2010, uh, when I moved I, in, I, li I lived and grew up in Vancouver, BC, but um, I, I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2010 to go to grad school and I, ha I moved on my own and I had to like learn all my walking routes and kind of like walking route from my like apartment to the grocery store and, and you know so on. And, um, and once I learned those places, those, they became like sort of my references to the city and like places in which I felt comfortable. So like I started just bringing people into that space and I don't identify as a blind person. Like you only, you just have to like look up synonyms for the word blind and you'll realize why I don't wanna like identify with that word. So I actually identify around my learning style which I often describe as like I'm a non-visual learner. I kind of like have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, um, it's, you know, I use my non-visual senses as a primary way of knowing my, the world around me and um, just kind of shifted the value at one point um, from the visual to the non-visual. And I really think of the walking tour as like intentional time spent with eyes closed. It's not like a simulation of my experience because I think there's some of that that people can't access. Um, but it's, it's really time spent with eyes closed, learning how to exercise the non-visual senses. So when you open your eyes, you realize that you're leaving like this vast dimension that you, you potentially would want to return to. Um, what is this? Hanging painting, okay, well this is from um, 2015 when I was um, in Ireland at the Model Contemporary Art Center. Um, I kind of did a couple projects through this uh, residency program called the Bureau of Radical Accessibility. Um, my friend Megan Johnston started this residency just as a means to like create a space in the institution to think about accessibility from like a wide open perspective, not 
necessarily just in relation to the disability community, but we had been talking about accessibility and I've been writing about it a bit. And, um, and, and Megan really thinks a lot about publicness and what's uh, institution's responsibility to a public. And I, I talk a lot about accessibility. So we were really thinking about, I, I had started describing accessibility as not really the condition of the body or like what the obstacles in the built environment are, but um, more of like a, the degree to which one can hold agency in a given situation. So it's really about like agency and power. Um, and so like the, I, I did a couple projects at the model center that kind of like in, engage this idea. And so I, I found this one gallery that was full of painting. It was like, it had paintings on the wall that were hung at like a typical height for a standing viewer. Um, and so I just suggested that they be lowered to like, you know, really close to the floor. Um, so people, that, that viewing position was, became more of an embodied position. It's like the viewer would have to problem solve their, their kind of viewing experience and find a way to comfortably, comfortably, comfortably view the work. Um, and while it kind of problematized that typical access or that common access, it, um, it kind of like opened up access for like folks who are shorter and kids too who would just like walk up to the work and kind of view it. Is this a poster? <laughs> okay, so a couple of years ago, I uh, conducted an unsolicited accessibility audit of the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, <laughs> with what's a, It's a traditionally conservative institution. Um, it's in a former court building and the museum collections are in the former like holding cells for incarcerated folks. So it's like the site of colonial power and uh, you know, I would say cultural violence. So uh, we, I was wa working in a gallery in Vancouver's downtown east side. Uh, and uh, I'd been working with the co that community for uh, maybe three years at the time. Um, and I was working in this gallery called Gallery Gachet. And, and uh, it's a collectively run gallery run by community members. Uh, it has a mental health focus. And it's, I would say, like one of the more openly accessible spaces in Vancouver. Um, just based on the way that people, the collective politics of the space and the way people welcome folks in. Um, and just practice accessibility. So I kind of like called upon like my, I guess like the f six people that I felt like they were the best people to talk about accessibility with. And some of which like identified as disabled, but some of them didn't. Um, some identified as uh, persons of color or uh, my friend was like a trans uh, disability activist as well. And my friend Arlene was, um, a senior indigenous filmmaker who had been making these autobiographical films about her life but had little recognition for her work. So what we did was I asked the group, um, I developed this like access model called open access, which is kind of like I, the basic way to describe it is um, like accessibility as social practice. It's, um, it's kind of like the social model for accessibility where instead of like engaging a policy which is often like an enforcement model where you know, if these things aren't in place, someone's going to get sued. <laughs> um, it's more of kind of just making, it's organizing from accessibility from the grassroots. Um, accessibility is like an ongoing practice in one's community. Um, I would say everybody here practices accessibility based on the fact that everyone has preferences and, you know, uh, certain politics experiences that they're um, negotiating around others and that they're in community with. So what we did when we were auditing the Vancouver Art Gallery, instead of looking at like the physical barriers to the space um, and those conditions that are often looked at with accessibility audits, we were looking at the social, cultural, and political conditions. And one day we found ourselves um, in this gallery together um, and it was the show, photography show, with objects uh, made by indigenous artists. And um, we were just kind of crowded around this wall text and one of my friends started reading it and it became really clear that they're misrepresenting um, colonization. And uh, we had been talking about indigenous politics uh, and you know our friend Arlene as well, um, based on her background, uh, we, we had been holding space for some of these ideas. So we, we had noticed that the wall text was written by the um, associate, um, director and, and chief curator of the institution who'd been there for 30 years. Um, and we just thought that that, like, while it was something you might just 
pass by, it really pointed to the collective politics of the gallery and who, like what the politics of people in positions of power were. So what we started to think about is what would this text look like if it was edited by the artists who um, work out of Gallery Gachet. Um, so we all did this like um, edit of the text in red corrective marker. Um, and um, <laughs> provided the decolonial narrative that wasn't um, available through the museum. And, you know, calling out, well, in the original text, you know, um, first contact by European settlers was referred to as like an exchange between cultures. And so we um, kind of like, you know, just called colonization out as, as genocide, which is also like a language that the Canadian government resists. Um, so. After that project, I, I sort of, um, it was a three month process that ended with a, um, the audit uh, ended with an exhibition. I basically condensed that process into a workshop that I've been taking to um, uh, city departments and universities and museums and really introducing this new social model for accessibility as a new paradigm for accessibility. So I've been thinking of this like last couple of years as like a movement building campaign for open access. Um, tomorrow I'm going to be leading a workshop on open access, so uh, around 2, 2.45, so if anyone's interested in learning more. Um, I, yeah, this is an image from a march that it, I, I led this summer at this big show in Ottawa at City Hall, and it kind of just showed my progress with open access over the last couple of years. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we've talked a lot about today is the different communities and the different um, people that we have to involve in all our conversations. And I think that it's very important when we make those lists of the communities we're engaging that uh, ability and disability is included in those, in, those, in those contexts. Disability and ability are things that cross all cultural lines and all identifications and is the most human of all of our lived experiences in many ways. So thank you, Carmen.